Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am deeply honored and truly delighted to be uh, moderating this event with a 2020 Dan David Laureate in the field of cultural preservation and revival, Lonnie Bunch, the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution and the founding director of the National Museum for African American History and Culture. Um, it goes without saying that I would have been even more delighted uh, had we been in the same room in Tel Aviv right now as uh, we should have been. But this is 2020 and Zoom is all we've got. Um, so we will try and uh, make the best of it. Um, before we begin our conversation with Secretary Bunch, I would like to welcome uh, two esteemed uh, local gentlemen. Uh, first, Professor Ariel Porat, the president of Tel Aviv University and the chair person of the Dan David Prize, and then Ariel David, who is the director of the Dan David Foundation. So, Professor Porat. Thank you, Yael. Uh, the David family, uh, Mrs. Gabby David and Mr. Ariel David, the director of the Dan David Foundation, Professor Itamar Rabinovich, chairperson of the Dan David Foundation, Charlotte Old, director of the Dan David Prize, and Dr. Yael Sternhell, an Americanist at the Faculty of Humanities, is our session moderator today, students and faculty members, friends of Tel Aviv University from all over the world, and of course, most especially our guest today, Secretary Loni Bunch. We are delighted to be hosting this webinar with Secretary Bunch, the winner of the 2020 Dan David Prize in the field of cultural preservation and revival. In usual times, he would have been our guest in Tel Aviv for a weekend of prize celebrations, but these are unusual times. And this webinar gives us the opportunity to learn about Bunch's extraordinary work as founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. When Bunch was chosen by the Dan David Price Review Committee, I had the privilege of informing him of his selection on the telephone. At that time, in early February 2020, we could not have guessed how the George Floyd killing would ignite what has been termed as the largest mass protest in United States history. We could not have predicted how urgent it would become to better understand the African-American story and experience of racism in the United States and elsewhere. Today, more than ever, we need historians like Lonnie Bunch who don't shy away from telling difficult truths and who can lead others to grapple intelligently, sensitively and factually with the past. Only a proper understanding of past injustices can lead to a genuine resolution of the present ones. This is true in America, this is true in Israel, and this is true everywhere in the world. I would also like to mention Lonnie Bunch's scholarate of the Dan David Prize this year, Professor Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, who is present today at our webinar. She is a leading performance studies scholar who created the core exhibition at the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. We congratulate them both on their work in illuminating gloomy chapters in history and thereby lighting the way to a better future. The role of history in our lives and world was a particular fascination of the founder of the prize, the late Dan David. I'm certain he would have been very pleased by this year's selection of Lorette's and also by this webinar that extends the Dan David Price message to a wider audience globally. We'll now ask his son, Ariel David, to say a few words. Ariel, please. Good evening or good morning to you all. I hope you can hear me well. Um, uh, thank you, first of all, thank you, Ariel, Professor Parat. Thank you for your very uh, kind and, and touching opening remarks. And I wish to thank also Dr. Yael Sterno for moderating this webinar and uh, Charlotte Halle and Ayana Segel-Cohen for organizing it. 
And I also wish to greet and to thank uh, Professor Barry Bergdahl and, professors, uh, and Professor Eran Neumann, who were respectively the chair, the chairperson and the member of the review committee for this year's past time dimension, and who have also joined us here online uh, today. Um, and of course, I wish to extend a warm welcome to you, Secretary Lonnie Bunch, and to take this opportunity to congratulate you for becoming part of the growing family of Dan David Prize laureates. Uh, I would have preferred to do this in person, as Professor Parad mentioned, uh, and I also still hope that we will have the opportunity to host you in Tel Aviv uh, in the not too distant future. As most of you know, each year the Dan David Prize awards three prizes in the past, present, and future time dimensions. And each year we select three different fields on which to focus. This year, the past prize was given in the field of cultural preservation and revival, and was ultimately shared between Secretary Bunch and Professor Barbara Kirschenblatt-Gimblet, the chief curator of the Pauline Museum, whom I also greet as I understand she is here with us as well. Now, as is often the case, the board of the prize chose this particular field because we felt it was uh, specifically relevant to our times. Today, the diverse rainbow of humanity's cultural heritage is not only threatened by the ravages of time, uh, by the erosion of memory and artifacts, but also by more active and insidious attempts to rewrite and weaponize history for ideological purposes. These efforts tend to distort, deny, or minimize the role and the trauma of entire peoples and cultures in the historical narrative, as well as their contribution to the construction of our present world. Often this is done with the aim of marginalizing and disenfranchising particular groups or minorities in the present or in the future. It is only through the integrity and dedication of researchers, educators, and policymakers that this pernicious process can be countered. Through his work in establishing the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Secretary Bunch has fully embodied these values, spearheading the creation of a unique space dedicated to exploring, documenting, and showcasing the African American story and its impact on the history of the United States and the world. You, Secretary Bunch, exemplify how cultural preservation is not just about the maintenance and academic study of traditions, artifacts, or documents from the past. It is also about keeping that past alive, about making it speak to new generations through a, histo through a historical narrative that is grounded in facts and research rather than in ideology, bias, and prejudice. It is no secret that the ongoing conflict over race relations and their impact on American society is also very much a confrontation on how, on how the history of these same relations is remembered, interpreted, and communicated. We are very fortunate to have Secretary Bunch and Dr. Sternel here today to guide us through the complex intersections between race and memory, between past and present. So I will not take up any more of their time and just wish us all an interesting and productive discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, okay, so uh, let me introduce Secretary Bunch. Uh, this could have gone longer. Uh, it is not his full and extremely uh, impressive biography, but hopefully it will give those of you who do not know him um, a sense of, of what he has accomplished. So uh, Lonnie G. Bunch uh, III is the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution since assuming this position in 2019. He now oversees 19 museums, 21 libraries, the National Zoo, numerous research centers, and several education units and centers. Previously, Bunch was the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. When he started as director in July 2005, he had one staff member, no collections, no funding, and no site for a museum. Driven by optimism, determination, and a commitment to build a place that would make America better, as he has phrased it, Bunch transformed a vision into a bold reality. 
The museum has welcomed more than 6 million visitors since it opened in September 2016 and compiled a collection of 40,000 objects that are housed in the first green building on the National Mall. There were years, and I can say this from personal experience, that there were absolutely no tickets at any time of the day to get in there. Um, occupying a prominent location next to the Washington Monument, the nearly 400,000 square foot National Museum of African American History and Culture is the nation's largest, and most comprehensive cultural destination devoted exclusively to exploring, documenting, and showcasing the African American story and its impact on America and um, on the world. Before his appointment as director of the museum, Bunch has, has had an eminent career as a museum curator and director. In a profession where Black executives are few and far between, he also served as the curator of history and program manager for the California African American Museum in Los Angeles from 1983 to 1989, where he curated several award-winning exhibitions. He worked at the Smithsonian, holding several positions as its National Museum of American History from 1989 through, two, through 2000. And then in his last role before taking on the work of founding uh, the African American History Museum, Bunch served as the president of the Chicago Historical Society. There he led a successful capital campaign to transform the society in celebration of its 150th anniversary, managed an institutional reorganization, initiated an unprecedented outreach initiative to diverse communities and more. Bunch has produced several historical documentaries for public television and has held numerous teaching positions at universities across the country, including American University in Washington, DC, the George Washington University in Washington, DC, and uh, the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts in Dartmouth. A widely published author, Bunch has written on topics ranging from the black military experience the American presidency and all black towns in the American West um, to diversity and museum management and the impact of funding and politics on American museums. His most recent book is A Fool's Errand, creating the National Museum of African American History and Culture in the age of Bush, Obama and Trump, which I uh, highly recommend uh, to anyone um, participating in this webinar. Among his many awards, he has won the Freedom Medal, one of the four Freedom Awards from the Roosevelt Institute for his contribution to American culture as a historian and storyteller, the WBE Du Bois Medal from the Hutchins Center at Harvard, and the National Equal Justice Award from the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. And this year, he is the winner of the Dan David Prize in the area of cultural preservation and revival. So before we start uh, with questions, I just want to remind everyone uh, that this webinar uh, format uh, allows questions in the Q&A box. So please feel free um, uh, to shoot and we will get to your questions. Uh, if there's time after my questions, I have a lot of questions. So uh, <laughs> be, be bold and be quick. So we will get a chance uh, to let you in too. All right, Secretary Bunch. So, um, you know, it almost goes uh, without saying that this year has been monumental in terms of thinking about, showcasing, arguing about African American uh, memory and history in the United States. And I'm wondering whether you see the events of the last few months as a real turning point, as a sea change, or do you think that this is a fleeting moment that is already gone because we're facing uh, such an important election and because there's so many new and, and different challenges that Americans are facing that, that will um, allow this moment to just kind of fade away without having a real impact on how we narrate American history? Well, first, let me just simply say how humbled I am to receive this award. This means so much to me. <laughs> Um, when you were reading my bio, I kept thinking, geez, this guy can't keep a job. So <laughs> I'm really sort of humbled by um, the recognition and to be able to share it with Barbara means a great deal to me. So I just want you to know how much this recognition means to me, because it's really about the importance of history, the power of history. 
the importance of making sure that history is as much about today and tomorrow as it is about yesterday. So thank you so much for that. Now let me answer your question. Um, you know, in some ways, as a historian and as an African American, I've seen this moment many times before. I've seen moments where broken black bodies have led the protest. I've seen moments where people have decided that it was crucial to challenge a nation to live up to its stated ideals. And I've seen moments where there was really transformation that there were moments where laws were passed, Supreme Court decisions were changed, and that in essence, there really was moments of hope, if not optimism. When I look at this moment, I am hopeful because of several reasons. First of all, I think the visibility of this through social media has made this not a moment where George Floyd is a Minnesota story, but rather this is a story that's a broader American story and an international story. When I see people crossing racial lines to protest in Paris, in London, to raise issues in Los Angeles, in Washington, DC, I find myself thinking that this may be that tipping point, that inflection moment where we can actually have the kinds of changes that are needed. When I see police officers actually questioning their processes, I'm optimistic, but I have to be candid. I've seen this before, and I've seen moments where through the 1960s, for example, there were so many laws passed that seemed to sort of point America in a new direction. And then we had an election in 1968 where the candidate Richard Nixon talked about law and order, that the country was out of control, and that allowed the nation to turn away from social justice and more towards controlling, which led to mass incarceration. So it's a long way of saying, I am hopeful at this moment, because I see younger people being involved. I see people crossing racial lines, but I also know that this is a, um, right now that there's a battle for the soul of the United States. And so I think the key for the future will be the both what will happen in this election in a couple of weeks and whether or not this will really continue to stimulate issues of social justice or will it fall back to let's control people by falling back to law and order. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're, we historians um, tend to be pretty skeptical, right? <laughs> we've seen it all. We've seen the Civil War, we've seen the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, there's always a backlash, there's always a response, right? That comes usually faster than one would expect and, and, um, and kind of shatters that optimism sometimes to bits and pieces. Um, if we focus on, on the realm of, of culture uh, in which you are such a prominent figure, um, I, mean, I think what, what's undeniable is that the renewed interest in African has, it has come to uh, be displayed uh, in television, in, um, in, in film, in, in kind of the, the media of popular culture. Uh, that feels uh, undeniable. I mean, cultural critics, I think, would easily say now that the most interesting work done in the realm of popular culture um, revolves around African-American history. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, how do you see the relationship between the museum and this new trend, uh, this kind of wave of productions that are trying to center on African-American history? Um, both in terms of has the museum had any impact on this, do you think? And has the kind of, you know, the new awakening by people who've seen Watchmen, right? And mm -hmm. are uh, sort of realizing that something happened in Tulsa in 1921, which they've never heard about because it's not in textbooks. Um, do they engage with the museum differently? You know, I think you've really framed what is so important, and that is this cultural moment. You know, in the 1960s, there was this discovery of blackness. So you saw these movies and these films, many of them were unrealistic, uh, stereotypical. What you see now is really a discussion to try to figure out how is this story a story that shapes us all? That it's not just an African-American story, but it's a broader American and international story. And I think that I'm quite proud that I think the museum has played a really important role. As you know, <clears throat> The National Mall is where the world comes to learn what it means to be an American. And now to have a National Museum of African American History and Culture so prominent 
it really changes the discourse, the dialogue. And in some ways, the, the African-American Museum has sort of said that African-American culture is legitimate. And you see many of the television, the film people, not only coming to the museum to learn that history, but to use the museum as backdrop. I mean, I'm, I was so proud that um, the television show Scandal um, with star Carrie Washington was filmed in the museum. Of course, oh, the yeah. day she filmed, I wasn't there to meet her, so I'm disappointed still. Um, I, me but, too. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that what's clear is that the museum has given people the latitude to recognize that there are important stories about African American culture that need a broader audience. Um, and that many people have been coming to the museum as filmmakers, as writers, to sort of use this as um, ground that they can build upon to tell these important stories. I think it's also really been important that it's sort of forced the museum to be much more active in cultural conversations. Um, that rather than as many Smithsonian museums do, which is step back from the controversy, this museum has said it is our role to help shape those conversations, to stimulate new cultural productions, to help people understand that unlike earlier moments, that the best way to understand this culture is to see it as, yes, richly African-American, but also profoundly American. And that's a fundamental difference. And that's part of what you see even the debates in the cultural community as to, is this an ancillary story or is this central to who we all are as Americans? Right, which of course stands for, are African-Americans a minority in America or are they American? Is African-American a story within the larger story? Or as I tell my students, this is the only thing there is. This is real American history. I think it is the quintessential American story. If you want to understand American core values of optimism, of spirituality, of resiliency, where better to look than the African-American community? And if you want to understand the limits of America, of the limits of the American promise, where better than the African-American community? And in many ways, I would argue African-American history is what has propelled America periodically to live up to its stated ideals that when you see the struggle for the end of slavery, the struggle to end segregation, you begin to realize that yes, this profoundly changes the African-American experience, but it profoundly changes the American experience. It changes the way immigrants are treated or allowed into the country in the, in the late 1960s, early 70s. It changes our notions of citizenship. So in some ways, I would argue that the African-American experience is the way to understand the promise of America, the limits of that promise, but also in many ways, the African-American community believed in an America that didn't believe in them. They had faith in the, in the ideals of America. And one of the things as a historian that amazes me is how do people have that faith? How do they believe that? When yeah. you think about your ancestors are raised in slavery, how do you, how do you envision a world of freedom? When you deal yeah. with segregation, how do you envision a world of fairness? So what I find so fascinating is that America has always been a work in progress and the African-American experience has been a key factor to challenging, to prodding, to pushing, to holding a mirror to America and saying, here's what you say you are, here's who you right. really are, but right. here's who you can be. Right, and even if you can't see it, we can see it, right? It's the African-American community that can Kind of had this expansive view of what America can be. Interesting. Okay, so let's flip this uh, around though, because some of the most violent and bitter public confrontations in the past few years have also been about memory, right? And you end your book, A Fool's Errand, um, with uh, events in Charlottesville in the summer of, of 2017. And we've seen this happen now over and over again around numerous monuments um, and, and cultural signifiers of, of African-American history. Why do you think that so much of the kind of visceral political conflict within American society is channeled into struggles about memory? 
I mean, what what is it about these monuments that makes them this arena of of such um, extreme emotion and dedication by both sides of the political divide? I think in many ways you can tell so much about a country by what it remembers, by what it builds monuments to, by what graces the walls of its museums. But I think you tell even more about a country by what it forgets or what it tries to not recall. And in some ways, what is so powerful about what's happening around these monuments is that people are realizing this is not about a stone figure. It's about America's identity. It's about the definition of what memories are, are dominant? What memories should we affect and embrace? I think it also tells us that this is a time when more people are asking about history, asking to understand better what history has. And what you're really seeing is history at the heart of this debate. Um, and it's a, bait, it's a debate over whether these monuments are really the best way for us to remember who we once were. Or are these monuments the kinds of things that need to be pruned, that need to be toppled, that need to be changed, one, to make room for other monuments, but also to recognize that we know more about our history. We understand more about the interaction between founding fathers and slavery. We understand much more about challenges of gender. And so I think for many people, these become the symbol of what America you believe in. Do you believe in America that simply looks back, um, that harkens back to a past that was romanticized um, and not inclusive? Or do you look towards an America that is more progressive and recognizes that it's at a moment of change and transformation and that these monuments are really meant to be something that identify our identity at a certain moment? but that we shouldn't be held captive by those forever. And I think that what you're really seeing is a simple forum for people to be able to say, I believe that we should be one way, I believe we should be another way. And what's hidden in this is really a, a fundamental question about inclusivity and diversity. And that whether America is a country whose memories should always be shaped by the sort of same white individuals that have been at the core, or are those memories now to be expanded and reframed through the lens of new historical knowledge, through the lens of a changing diverse America? I think so in a way, this is really the sort of arena where you're really seeing the struggle for the soul of America play out. Right. You know, one of the debates um, that, that I've had with students, and, and this is, directly from a seminar on um, the public memory of, of slavery and the Civil War, which I taught uh, last spring and which you were supposed to be the guest of honor in. Um, one of the questions that, that we really tried to wrap our heads around and never quite felt like we nailed it um, is the question, I can see why white supremacists deeply care about having a Robert E. Lee Mm -hmm. monument in the center of their town. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. But then the question that we were asking is a young African-American man in an underprivileged neighborhood, you know, somewhere in America, dealing with poorly funded schools with a highly discriminatory um, a, a racial uh, order and a criminal justice system, um, with you know all these endemic problems that America simply just cannot resolve, does it matter to him too? I mean, does this symbolism? How does this symbolism that we're fighting over, that Americans are fighting over so fiercely, how does it translate to the day-to-day -day experiences of of African Americans? I think pruning monuments are not going to improve the educational system. Right? Debating over the Robert E. Lee is not going to create greater economic opportunity on the one hand. But on the other hand, what these debates do and what they mean for me when I was a kid seeing mainly white memories um, and when I talked to my daughters, what 
they see is these debates, changing these statues, talk about a sense of possibility, a sense of change. And I think the challenge for many people trapped in the inner city is that they don't believe that there's a, there's a different future. They don't believe that there's a possibility of profound and fundamental change. And so in a simple way, what this debate does is allows people to believe that wrongs can be confronted, that change is possible. And I was really struck, there's a monument in Washington, D.C. that is sort of dedicated to Abraham Lincoln, and there's a lot of controversy because it's Lincoln sort of freeing the slaves. Yeah. So I would go to that monument night after night to watch the protests and to talk to young Americans, especially young Black Americans. And the notion was, if the monument was now changed to say Black folks weren't given freedom, but that they demanded it, that they struggled for it, they felt that gave them a sense of empowerment, gave them a sense of possibility that could allow them to then challenge some of the prevailing issues that are shaping many parts of the African-American community. So for me, it is not that changing statues will not get us to the promised land, but it'll make people believe that okay. change is possible. Yeah. No, that's highly actually encouraging uh, for us historians of the 19th century because it shows that decades of work in digging up that history of Black self-liberation um, during the Civil War and of Black empowerment and initiative during Reconstruction um, does make a difference. That and, I, and I think in many ways, you put your finger on what's important, is that we wouldn't be at this moment without 50 or 60 years of amazing scholarship around yeah. issues of race and African-American culture, because part of what's happening is people are asking questions about history that we once didn't have the answers to. Yeah. Um, and so I think yeah. now this is, this is the time for historians to, to shine in many ways. No, I mean, I actually feel the same way. It's, you know, the historical profession is uh, always in some kind of crisis, right? And uh, especially now. Uh, but I feel that in the field of African-American history, um, the impact is deeply felt. And, and I thought that way, I've been thinking that way since uh, the 2012 movie, 12 Years a Slave. Mm -hmm. When I watched it, I felt like, okay, this is 50 years of scholarship right. on a screen. Right. And the people who will not read the scholarship will watch the film. And it's, you know, it's our work out there um, to much larger and more diverse audiences. And, and in that way, I think that the profession really has been vindicated. And I, and I think if you look at things like one of the reasons that I, I went to work at the Smithsonian is I realized what a canvas we have to paint on, right? That there are millions of people who won't read my book, won't, won't you know, take your class, but who will come to the Smithsonian because it's a trusted source and they'll grapple with questions that we think are important, questions shaped by scholarship. So for me, this was not just a way to translate scholarship, but to really think about how do we engage a curious public around the best scholarship to use that scholarship to invigorate, to challenge, to prod, to help them find the tools they need to grapple with the challenges they face and to push a country to be better. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay, this is, I, I have, my head is spinning. Um, so when they run me out of the country, make sure I can come to Israel, okay? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, well, well you, you know what's going on here, so <laughs> no need to uh, elaborate on that. Um, and, but if you've been, mentioned Israel, um, you know, here in Israel, at least in our conversations within academia, which obviously is a limited uh, realm, but still uh, important. Um, we often think about the African-American past in conjunction with the Jewish past. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are obviously many similarities. There are obviously many differences, not to mention the uh, very complex relationship between these two communities mm -hmm. uh, over the course of, of the 20th and, and two decades of the 21st century. I'm wondering what you've learned from Holocaust commemoration and what, how do you see the relationship between these two kind of grand tragedies of the Western world? And what do they have to teach each other in terms of how to think about the past productively and, and 
specifically for Holocaust memory, not get stuck in this position of eternal victimhood, right. but to grow right. from remembering. Well, in many ways, I learned so much from the Holocaust studies, from my time in Israel that shaped the way I created the museum. Very early on in the process, when I only had a staff of sort of eight people, um, I actually brought them all with me to Israel um, so that we could spend several weeks looking at, you know, the Palmach Museum and Yad Vashem and looking at the, the important cultural sites in Israel because of one reason, because I felt that the Israeli museums did the best job of any museums that I know globally about exploring national identity, regardless of the subject of the museum. It's really about helping people understand that this is about national identity, not simply the past. And what I wanted was to craft a museum that was about Americans' identity, that said the identity of America is a broader, more inclusive identity shaped by the African-American experience. So I came to Israel to learn how. I also spent a lot of time early in my career helping to do work with the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that it taught me was the delicate balance of how to recognize tragedy, but how not to buy in and embrace victimization. That it's a really fine line. And I wanted to basically, what I learned is that I needed, in order to help people see the change that happens in the African-American experience, I needed people to understand the tragedy. And so looking at the Holocaust studies helped me understand that I had to find the right tension between a kind of progressive narrative and a narrative that was based on tragedy, pain, and hatred. Right. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about and I've been working on is trying to find ways to bring closer collaboration between the Black and Jewish communities in the, in the States especially. That here are groups that have had moments of real collaboration, but they've also had groups that had real tension on a variety of issues. And yet they're also the groups that are also targeted so often by those that want to return to an America that really should no longer exist. So I've always felt there needed to be a way to understand the tensions, the debates, but to recognize we're stronger when we can find some of those common grounds. Yeah. Kune, I guess I feel that the African-American community has been more expansive in its understanding of its own tragedy vis-a-vis -vis other tragedies uh, than perhaps some Jewish communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that there have been more universal lessons learned there um, that, than some Jewish communities have, have learned. Um, and that it shows it shows the kind of the, the breadth of African-American, both historical and ethical and moral and religious thinking that um, this community can, can translate its own pain and tragedy um, into universal essence. And what the African-American community does is recognize that it's a large reservoir to dip into of different histories, different stories, different tragedies. And so you see the African-American community using all of that. Um, using biblical stories about um, the exodus of Jews, using the kind of sort of collaborations one might see to be able to sort of say, here are opportunities for this community. And so one of the things that I am sort of proudest of is I think that looking at history, African-Americans become very nimble at finding what is the right solution, what is the right inspiration, whether it's debates over should the, should should freed African-Americans leave the United States? Should they stay? Um, all these debates really are crucial to helping define the patterns that led to change in this community. So I think that in many ways, there is a desire, maybe out of need, out of pain, out of worry, but a desire to say, how can we be more nimble? And how can we learn from many others so that we can affect the change that we think is crucial to help the African-American community? Yeah. No, I mean, pr pragmatism is definitely a defining feature um, of, of the way this community has carried itself. Um, well, I, I would almost argue the word I use is improvisation, right? Well, we usually traditionally say that as a musical term, but the African-American community has this sense of improvisation. 
How do you handle a situation? You've got to improvise. How do you find new practices to move forward? You improvise. That's been one of the greatest strengths. So whenever I hear a jazz musician improvise, I think of an enslaved person figuring out ways to control his or her destiny. Yeah. I think of somebody saying, how do I leave the South to find opportunities in the North? It's part of that improvisation. Yeah. No, that's actually kind of fantastic. Um, I've never thought of that. It's pretty brilliant. You should write about it. Um, okay. Um, one question about uh, museology. Um, going into the 20th century and especially 21st century, and especially now that we are in this kind of bizarre world of life through Zoom, um, how do you see the future of the Smithsonian Institution? Of uh, what what kind of projects do you have in the works? How do you see yourself um, transforming the the Smithsonian into a world that's uh, increasingly digital and hopefully not for good, but increasingly um, a world increasing increasingly lived at home um, in front of a computer screen? Well, you know, I mean, I think. <laughs> Um, the joy of being a leader during a pandemic, I'll tell you. Um, but, but I think that what I realized is that the most important thing we can do as, as museums, especially the Smithsonian, is not use this to figure out how do we get through this moment, but to use it to reimagine, to ask questions that we haven't asked before, to sort of really think creatively about what the 21st century museum should be and how to, how to work effectively. And I think you put your finger on one of the most important issues. And that is that we now know more people globally are comfortable receiving content digitally than ever before. So how do we take advantage of that? But how do we, in essence, ask this different question? How do we find the right tension between traditions and innovation? How do we make sure that we, do not leave behind these bricks and mortar buildings, these amazing collections. And how do we find ways to integrate that rather than either see a digital first strategy or a museum collection only strategy? How do we find what in essence I call a new integration? And how do we find ways that one of the great strengths of cultural institutions is that they create informal communities people who don't know each other come together in a museum around an artifact or an exhibition or a public program and the conversations and the thoughts change very much because of that interaction. Well, how in a sort of pandemic age, how do we create that informal communities? So thinking about what social distancing means in museums, but in a way that doesn't prevent that kind of interaction. I also think the key for me is that this is pushing cultural institutions in a direction I believe very strongly in. And that is, I believe cultural institutions, museums need to define how they're of value to the communities they serve today. That yes, there are traditional things they do well, the great collections and the storytelling, but yet I would argue that cultural institutions have a social justice role, a community role. In essence, they need to recognize that cultural institutions cannot become community centers, but they could be at the center of their communities. They can be places that give people that trusted source to be able to grapple with what divides us, to be able to bring people together who normally won't cross lines, but will come to the Smithsonian to do that. So I've initiated a major initiative called Race, Community and Our Shared Future, really grappling with how race has been one of the great chasms in the United States. Um, and how it has been shaped both by national considerations and local issues. And so trying to bring together scholars to sort of go to Minneapolis, at least virtually, and think about how do we find ways that are solutions to the challenges these communities face. So I really feel strongly that the Smithsonian has a role to use its science to help people understand that we know a lot about the transmission of viruses from animals to humans. How do we bring the expertise of the Smithsonian so that it really is a place that people view as much about today and tomorrow as it is about yesterday? Yeah, I'm. I'm really hoping, um, you know, th that there will be a once this is over, uh, whenever that will be, uh, in a year or two, whenever there is a vaccine and life can resume, that people will want to leave the house. That it's not 
that, that, that the Zoom life will feel isolating and that museums with the kind of really sort of visceral feeling that you get when you walk into a wonderful exhibition will will be even more appealing than they used to be. And that the, the, the uh, sense of walking around the National Mall, I mean, it's one of the most beautiful and, and most powerful places in the world. And that there will be a, 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 an appetite, a desire to, to do that again, uh, rather than, you know, keep watching whatever on, on your screen at home. Well, you know, I've reopened eight of the Smithsonian Museums and the zoo, and I have been overwhelmed by the public response, this desire to get out, to yeah. engage people in a safe way, to be able to find escapes for their children and the like. And so in some ways, on a very practical sense, museums are fulfill that great need to engage with people, the great need to sort of get outside of your Zoom camera. But it's also the opportunity to say, how do we understand better what the audience needs now because they've changed. There's more fear, there's more concern, there's more needs. So I think the other challenge for a place like the Smithsonian is to really do a better job of understanding their audience and really being that interactive place that allows the audience needs to shape some of the things that we do. Right. Okay, uh, well, well, we'll have to see. We'll have to see how history unfolds um the history of this pandemic okay i'm gonna be um uh, a responsible moderator and uh use some uh really wonderful audience questions that we've been getting uh over the past uh 50 minutes or so and um, i'll start with a question by sonia who is uh, uh wondering uh if you could tell us a bit about the museum how the, sorry how the museum collected the various cultural artifacts were the objects found in private collections? If so, who were the collectors? Or were they in public collections or not in collections at all? When I was creating the African American Museum, I felt the biggest challenge was going to be building collections. I knew the Smithsonian because I had worked at several museums. And even if I said, let me take everything the Smithsonian had about African American history, it was only 20% of what we needed. And what I didn't want, I didn't want all things African-American to be in one building. I wanted to see how the, how the American Art Museum talked about issues of race or the Air and Space Museum. So I remember testifying in front of Congress where they said, oh, can you find collections? And I lied like a rug. I said, oh, sure, no problem. And I was worried, but I have to tell you the story. One night I actually fell asleep in front of the television and woke up and there was something called Antique Roadshow. I had never heard of it. And I realized that so much of the 19th century and almost all the 20th century might still be in the basements, trunks, and attics of people's homes. So I basically reframed That's Antique Roadshow. That's amazing. Yeah, and I went around the country. We said, bring out your stuff. Now, we didn't say we want to collect it. In fact, I brought people to say, let us help you preserve grandma's old shawl or that 19th century photograph or that you know railroad pocket watch. But then that led to people saying, well, do you want this? And people would sort of, you know, read about it or see it on television and contact us. And out of the 40 to 50,000 objects we would collected, 70% came out of the trunks and attics of people's homes. 70%, yeah, that's, um, that's remarkable. Now, what about local, I'm just, um, um, I'll piggyback on that. Local museums, uh, Southern plantations, mm -hmm um you know the museum of the confederacy in right. richmond which I've, I've i've used their archives many times so i know their collection right. um so what i mean were these places that you could converse with bargain with could you buy things from them i mean did you did money exchange hands somehow well, you know, we did very little. I mean, I wish I had more money than we did. So we didn't really buy much at all. And my notion was that I didn't want to take things from other cultural institutions. I really wanted to make sure that we challenged them to do their work in a different way, in a better way. And so I think that what you see happening is that as a result of the museum's desire to collect and tell these stories, you first of all see 
a spike in visitation African-American museums and historic sites around the country. That in essence, as if the National Museum opened the door and so many other people said, well, what's going on in our local community? And we crafted opportunities so that when you came online to look at the museum and you saw something on slavery, we said, but you know, if you're in Louisiana, you could see it at these plantations. Or you so we basically said, let us be a beacon that draws people to Washington and then let's push them back to local communities. So the key was not so much what we collected, but what we preserved. The key was not so much all the stories we told, but how to recognize that nobody has broad enough shoulders to tell all this history. So we wanted to create networks so people could sort of do a civil rights trail or a slavery trail um, or a civil war trail so that therefore people could sort of learn even more than we could ever hope to do yeah. in this building. No, that's that's actually, you know, it's true that we, we kind of, in a conversation with you, we will focus on the really immense power of having this glorious building in the middle of the mall, standing proud there, along with, you know, monuments to uh, America's white presidents. But there's also something really powerful about a Virginia plantation or a yeah. South Carolina plantation. Uh, you know, with all these places can be very problematic. And I personally have um, shouted at um, tour guides in some of these places. Um, so, you know, it's not always easy, but but you know, change is uh, change is slow and hard. Um, but but there's something to it, right? There's something about being a, a you know an African American in Virginia and and seeing it in your local community. You know, because what you do in museums, candidly, is you manufacture reality. But when you're on a plantation and you walk that dirt road and you see a few cabins extent, that's the, there's nothing more powerful than that. And the challenge is to make sure these these historic sites tell a fuller story. Like yeah. you, I've been thrown off of more plantation tours. You know, I, don't sure. ask another question, right? Um, but on the other hand, whenever I go into a plantation and I see these cabins, or I see descendants of the enslaved who still live in that community, um, there is something real and rich that I can't create in a museum. And so my hope is to create a network of cultural museums, of historic sites that allow people to sort of understand this history through different perspectives, from being on the grounds to being in places with amazing artifacts and brilliant scholarship. Yeah, fantastic. Um, okay, a great question uh, by Ross. Um, has the African American Museum started approaching how they would exhibit key events of spring to summer 2020? And I'm asking not only about the racial justice protests of Ju June and July, but also how COVID has disproportionately affected black and brown people. And thank you for all your work. Well, thank you. I created, before I left the African American Museum, um, a swift response team whose job it was to, first of all, think about what historians would need 50 years from now to understand today. And then secondly, to be able to react quickly to protests, to the pandemic. And we have collected um, an amazing amount of material, whether it is material that, you know, talks about the protests explicitly, um, whether it's asking people who are in those protests in Minneapolis or in Washington, D.C. to share the videos they've taken on their phone to give us new information, new ways to look at things. We've also said that it's crucially important to recognize that this is not just about protest, but also about impact. So one of the things we did is my youngest daughter is an emergency room doctor dealing with many people in lower, lower income communities. So we asked her, let's collect your story collect the, the things you use, collect the interviews, the photographs. So really trying to make sure that this moment, which I think is a pivotally important moment, will not be lost to history. And it also means thinking about things like we need to collect some Confederate monuments, because these are also things that are going to be crucial down the road to help people understand 2021, 2020. Yeah. Maybe that's where the you know historians of, of the Confederacy and of Confederate memory in, in the late 19th century South argue 
heatedly about where do these statues belong and perhaps where they belong is in the African American Museum as as monuments to Jim Crow right which is what mm -hmm. they really are rather than monuments to the Confederacy. I think that's absolutely right. I think that, you know, whether it's building on the model of what they did in Budapest or building on what they're doing in India, um, when the when the uh, mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landro, wanted to take down monument, Confederate monuments, he and I talked about the need to put them in a warehouse so people can engage them and they can be interpreted. So I do think it's really an important opportunity um, and I'm not a gardener, but I'm told that if you prune something, some things better grow. So let's prune some of those monuments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, Gary is asking also a really interesting question. Um, he's interested in the role of Congress in shaping or changing policy. What do you see? What is the level of your interaction, particularly with the African American caucus? Well, I think that first of all, one of the challenges and then one of the strengths of the Smithsonian is recognizing that it is a federal agency. So therefore, you've got to figure out ways, how do you work through a partisan Congress? So part of the notion was for me, was to build allies on both sides of the aisle, because you'll never manage the US Congress. But what you want is a tie, you want a nil nil draw, you want enough people to say what you're doing is good, so that it cancels out some of the criticism and some of the reaction that you may have. I think it's crucially important to recognize that you work with things like the Congressional Black Caucus, which is crucially important to the success of the museum, but also to the success of the Smithsonian. So you recognize that if you're going to be a leader, you have to be political, not in the sense that, you know, you're taking this point of view over that point of view, but recognizing that much like a campaign, you've got to build strategies, um, and make moves that allow you to move forward, not just react when the crisis comes. Well, if you've been able to keep your friends on both sides of the aisle, then I congratulate you for being the only person in Washington to do that. <laughs> it's a small group of friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. A question from Evelyn, uh, which you've already addressed in some way, but um, I think it's it's really well said, and I'd be interested in hearing how you would respond to this framing of it. Um, so Evelyn says, you were just addressing the educational potential of places like plantations. When I visit Auschwitz-Birkenau and I learn how about how much money is being spent to preserve barracks and old shoes, I sometimes find it perverse in the face of the great financial need to support living Jewish communities in Poland. Can you help me understand why we should put resources in preserving sites of cruelty and human subjugation? In some ways, I think without preserving those sites, memories are lost. Um, and when memories are lost, you're like a rudderless ship. And so I think it's important to make sure that those sites are preserved. I think when you look at the amount of money that's spent in the cultural arena versus other arenas, it's very small. Um, and I think that the challenge for historic sites is to recognize that they've got a contemporary role to make sure that it's clear what these sites tell us, not just about the past, but what they point us towards in terms of the future. I'm a, I'm a firm believer that um, a museum will not save the world, but without a museum, it's harder to save the world. Yeah. So when you see these piles of shoes in Ashworth, then the question shouldn't just be about remembering the Jews who perished there, but also thinking about, you know, wh which community is, is, is in this position right now and what, what can we do about it as citizens, as human beings, right? And I, and I think that's the key because remember, what you see when you see those shoes is the Holocaust gets reduced to human scale and that's important. Um, yeah. And so in some ways, these sites allow people to care in a way that a big issue of slavery washes over them. But if they're looking at what happened to a particular family in that cabin, it's harder to turn away. And so for me, it's really about how do these sites allow grand tragedies, grand narratives to be reduced to a scale that people will have to engage and people will have to look and not look away. Yeah, 
and and we often look away in today's world too. I mean, we're, we're you know perfectly honest with ourselves. Um, even people who do memory work and people who think about memory and write about memory, um, it's often easier to turn our gaze away. Yes, mm -hmm. and it's often easier to sometimes let it go because it is so painful what we see right. and what right. we care about. But right. then again, that's why they pay you the big bucks. Oh yeah, absolutely, <laughs> and you too, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, it is uh, seven o two p.m. in Israel, um, and I had marching orders uh, to wrap up at seven. Um, so I am uh, going to wrap up this conversation, which was, uh, in my mind, just absolutely fascinating, and will. Um, leave me with uh, a lot to, to chew on and think about um, in the future. And I desperately hope that you will uh, come to Tel Aviv in the flesh and that we can have this conversation uh, with students in the audience and perhaps even in some of the sites um, that we engage with um, in, in this troubled land with its own troubled mm -hmm. memories. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, Secretary Bunch, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak to us. And thank you, Professor Porat, president of Tel Aviv University, and Ariel David, um, the director of the David Foundation and Tel Aviv University staff uh, for organizing this. And thank you all for participating and listening and asking um, really intriguing and important questions. And uh, what can I wish you uh, more than uh, safety and sanity? And may this pandemic be uh, soon over and we can re-meet in person. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this immensely and I look forward to continuing the conversation. And again, let me end as I began. I am humbled by receiving this award, humbled by the opportunity to share sort of these thoughts with you and um, you inspire me to continue to fight the good fight. And we're grateful to you for uh, being a prize winner uh, and joining, like Ariel said, uh, the Dan David uh, community. Uh, it is a great privilege um, to have you with us. Thank you. And thank you, Yale, for being a wonderful moderator. Yes. <laughs> it was a real pleasure. Um, all right. Well, good night, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. And uh, take care, be safe, and uh, see you all soon. Bye-bye.